I, despite the many myriad of problems in Iraq, I do believe they are on the right track. On, in economic terms, it took them some 60 years, but Iraq has now has some major oil uh, deals with Western companies. I must say, rather ironically, as the American ambassador, I was very pleased that only one out of 11 was with an American company. For, so for those of you who claim that America was in Iraq for the oil, think again, because only one out of 11 was American. In fact, I'm probably the only American ambassador in the spring of 2010 to be out on an oil uh, platform extolling the virtues of British petroleum, because <laughs> <laughs> indeed it was British petroleum that was the first into Iraq. They have... Uh, they are the first to be digging, uh, uh, to be drilling for oil. If all goes well, and sometimes that has to be put in the subjunctive because it doesn't all go well in Iraq all the time, nonetheless, you can see that in some 10 years, Iraq should be pumping oil on the, to the tune of what, the, uh, Saudi, uh, what they pump in Saudi Arabia, some eight upwards of nine, of nine million barrels per day will be pumped in, in Iraq. This will give Iraq, and uh, it will give them some challenges, to be sure, in some of their new institutions, but it will give them the capacity to begin to pay for services, because many Iraqi people remain without proper services, without proper water supply, without proper electricity, without health supplies, et cetera. This will give Iraq the capacity to uh, begin to uh, to pay for these uh, pay for these services. It will also give Iraq the the capacity really to deal with some of their neighbors as some of their neighbors have dealt with them. That is, they don't want a situation where they are always the sub subject of money being brought in to influence their events. Maybe they can uh, reverse that flow somewhat. So I think Iraq will be far better off for this oil. Uh, the infrastructure will soon follow. You can see enormous infrastructure companies, including American companies, in there looking for ways to, uh, to build highways and other things, things that were long in, in disrepair under the regime of Saddam Hussein. So I do believe uh, that combined with some of the institutions, you know, Iraq, for all of its problems, has kept a pretty good central bank. They have a pretty good uh, handle on the money supply. They've managed the monetary aggregates in a way that, uh, well, some other countries might do better on that. Uh, so I think on the economic side, Iraq is going to be okay. On the, um, on the uh, political side, of course, one of the big questions is what, is what are the Kurds going to do? How long are they going to stay? Kurd, Kurd, uh, Kurdistan, or the KRG, the Kurdish regional government, has uh, autonomy that uh, the Liechtenstein uh, uh, Center never dreamed that a, that a uh, region of another country could, uh, could have. It is really quite remarkable. And so a lot of people say, well, why don't they just go independent? Well, first of all, we have made it very clear to the Kurds that we love them, but we love them only insofar as they remain a part of Iraq. So they understand that there are consequences to any unilateral declaration of independence. Secondly, what the Kurds have worked out with the central authorities, and this is always this kind of work in progress, but they get some 17% of revenues from the central authorities in, in Baghdad. Now, there are disagreements about whether this should just be a pass-through through the Ministry of Finance in Baghdad up to the uh, Office of Finance in uh, Erbil, or whether there should be more elements of it. It's always an argument, but it's basically been agreed that 17 percent, which is a rough uh, guess as to the Kurdish population, should be coming through, uh, should be going on to Erbil. 17 percent of southern Iraq oil is a heck of a lot more than 100 percent of Kurdish oil. And so uh, it doesn't take an advanced degree in arithmetic to understand that there is some benefit to the Kurds staying in, provided it can remain a democratic uh, Iraq and provided they can be part of the founding capital of Iraq. And when you look at the fact that the Kurds held very tough on the issue that they wanted to retain the presidency, even though the presidency in, in Iraq uh, is largely a ceremonial position. 
I think it's very significant that they wanted to hold on to the presidency, and I think it's very significant that the Kurdish leadership is saying to the Kurdish people, we are part of Iraq, and the proof is that the president of Iraq, the symbol of the Iraqi state, is a Kurd from Kurdistan. So uh, I am not saying take Kurdish independence off of our worry list. I would keep it on the worry list. But uh, fortunately, it's not on the top of the worry list. So I think we're doing OK on that. Uh, I think on the, um, in terms of security, um, uh, notwithstanding uh, some of the concerns that were expressed just before me by uh, Ms. Sofer, I think we should, uh, we should at least uh, take a step back and look at how the Iraqis have managed the security situation in, in recent years. It is getting a lot better. The security situation in Iraq, notwithstanding the, the reports we read every day in the press about car bombs, et cetera, overall the country, the, the country is getting a lot better. Now, in the United States, we tend to have a sort of solipsism about everything that happens in the world. That is, anything good that happens in the world must have happened because we did something. <laughs> and uh, in fact, when you look at a lot of the security gains in, uh, in Iraq, it's because the Iraqis did something. One of the chief things that Iraq ha has done is they've essentially uh, disbanded the militias. No militia in Iraq now holds a single street corner, let alone in any towns in Iraq. They have moved aggressively against militias. Most famously, when Maliki moved against the, uh, the uh, Badr Corps and other Shia, other Shia militias in, in, uh, in Basra. Now, that was a cause for many Americans to say, well, you know, he got into trouble and we had to help him, whatever. The fact is, he made the decision, he went in there, and Basra is a different place as a result of a decision Maliki made. Now, whether it went well and whether it's true that the United States forces had to rescue him, I think, frankly, is a very tiny footnote in history. The fact is, he moved against other Shia, other Shia um, uh, um, militia groups in a way that could not have been foreseen. Maliki also moved against some of the militia groups in, uh, in Sadr City as well. And so one of the reasons that it, it was so difficult for Maliki to unite the Shia in the, uh, in the aftermath of the elections is the, is the fact that the Sadrists hold him personally responsible for going after their militia groups, and they resent the hell out of the guy because of that. So um, the fact that there are very few independent militia groups or the ones that you see are now the ones that are essentially in hiding and operate clandestinely is a real testimony to the efforts of the of the Iraqis, not necessarily of the U.S. I'd like to make one other point about the elections because it uh, goes back to some earlier points I made about identity politics. Historically in Iraq, you have the Sunnis who, are, who think of themselves as a kind of ruling um, ruling uh, entity. That is, Iraq has been run by the Sunnis for many, many decades. When the British came in, in sort of classic British colonial style, they looked at the place, they found the meanest, toughest tribe, and they said, OK, you run this place. And so they anointed the Sunnis uh, uh, to do that. They did it all over the British Empire. Um, so the Sunnis have come to think of themselves as the ruling class of, uh, of Iraq. Well, when democracy came, uh, the Shia were empowered. The trouble with the Shia has always been the trouble with the Shia is they are divided. So when the election came for the parliament back in March, it is a 325-member parliament, 325-seat parliament. Alawi, who, by the way, is a, is a Shia, uh, but a so-called secular Shia, and it's important to understand that even under Saddam Hussein, who is essentially the authority arm of Sunni rule in Iraq, he also had some Shia around him. So the fact that Alawi happened to be a Shia meant nothing to the Shia parties, that is, representing Shia, Shia uh, population. They did not look at Alawi as one of them at all. 
So when Alawi's Iraqiya, and by the way, the party's name, Iraqiya, suggests it's a nationalist entity, that is, they, they, res they deeply resent any implication that they are a Sunni party, I'm just going on the simple arithmetic that just about every Sunni in Iraq voted for, for Iraqiya, whereas the Shia were spread out among different, uh, different parties. So when the election results came, this Sunni-based party came, had 91 seats, 91 out of the 325. Uh, the Kurds were actually uh, also uh, received, uh, I forget now, but I think it was some almost 50, uh, 50 seats, and then the rest were all Shia. So when it is said that Alawi won the election, he did win the election in the sense of his party, his bloc, got the most seats. But the way it works in Iraq's parliamentary system is not unlike the way it works in every parliamentary system, though we don't have that system in the United States, which may be part of the confusion in our press. But then it became up to Alawi to take the 91 seats and bring it to 163, that is, bring it to a majority in the parliament and come and say, I have 163 seats, I should be the prime minister. Alawi was unable to go from 91 seats to 92 seats, let alone to 163, and lo and behold, he was never able to get the kind of power that he needed in order to make a serious run at the prime ministership. All the other Shia, as divided as they were, and you would hear uh, Amar Hakim from, uh, from uh, Iski say, we will never join with Maliki. You would hear from, uh, from Muqtadr al-Sadr, we will never join with Maliki. Well, the fact is they would never join with Alawi. They would never be the minority partner in a Sunni-led uh, coalition. They never accepted it. Alawi had some eight months to try to make this work and never did. So the result was it took Maliki a long time too, but he was able to bring the Shia together, most importantly with Maliki, most importantly with Maliki. Early in August, uh, just a couple of months ago, three months ago, he went up to uh, see Barzani. He sat down with Barzani. They had a three-hour meeting. They had a lunch. They had a press conference. And Maliki, for all of his flaws as a leader, was able to sit down with the leader of the Kurds and work things out with him such that he achieved reconciliation with, uh, with um, uh, uh, Masoud Barzani. Maliki also uh, achieved reconciliation with the other Kur uh, main Kurdish leader, uh, that is, uh, from the other side of, uh, of uh, the Kurdish regional government and, and uh, the, the president and the new president as well, Jamal Ta Talabani. Maliki reached these agreements with these Kurds. With these agreements, he was able to reach agreements with some of the other Shia, and he was able to bring them in. And he was also able to reach agreements with some of the Sunni leadership, such that just on Tuesday, when Alawi was, uh, was wanting to leave the negotiation, it was the Kurds who kept him in. And so it was, a, uh, it was finally decided that uh, the new government will be uh, Maliki as prime minister, uh, Talibani again as president, and uh, Osama Najafi, a very tough, uh, very tough-minded Sunni leader as the speaker of the, of the uh, Council of Representatives. I'm getting my three minutes. I actually only need one more minute uh, to summarize the fact that what we see in Iraq is a very rough politics. It's a rough and tumble politics that's going to be Iraqi. It's a very rocky road there, but it will be an Iraqi road there. And uh, there will not be a, uh, really a scope for the Americans to tell them what to do. Uh, to be sure, um, uh, Prime Minister Maliki is not Thomas Jefferson, but I submit to you that if Thomas Jefferson were an Iraqi politician, he would not be Thomas Jefferson either. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> okay.